Hello and welcome to the EVN Disrupt podcast. My name is Nijda Tsatryan. I'm the editor of the creative tech section here at EVN Report. And today my guest was Ashut Arzumanyan, a partner at SmartGate VC, a pre-seed VC firm in Armenia. We spoke about the founding story of SmartGate, the startup ecosystem in Armenia, how it's developed over the last 18 months, challenges that startups in the country face, and how SmartGate is helping address them. Our guest today is Ashut Arzumanyan. He is a partner at SmartGate VC, a venture capital fund in Yegevan that uh, invests in pre-seed and seed stage startups. Um, Ashut, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Nishde. Thank you for having me. So Ashut, let's start with your uh, background. How did you get started in the venture capital space and how did you get started investing? So uh, my background is in finance and management consulting. But last uh, eight years, I'm uh, part of the startup world from the venture capital angle. Uh, being first an associate at a venture fund in Armenia and later started our own uh, VC firm with my partners. So since 2018, uh, we are investing from SmartGate VC. Mm -hmm. So SmartGate got its start in 2018. Yeah. Why did you guys decide to uh, create a VC firm in, in Yegevan, in Armenia? What was the opportunity that you saw? Yeah, so look, uh, when you uh, look at the landscape back then, uh, there were a lot of opportunities and a lot of talent mm -hmm. and really very little ecosystem that could nurture this talent and convert it to entrepreneurship. Uh, so uh, we had some initial pipeline uh, in mind, but also realized that there is so much to be done mm -hmm. uh, in order to kind of create a comprehensive ecosystem there. And uh, that's how actually the fund started, which was an institutional way of uh, advising and supporting companies, mm -hmm. founders, our friends, uh, and also helping them with capital. But also uh, Hero House, mm -hmm. which is the community arm of uh, our fund and leverages the community effort towards uh, supporting entrepreneurs and uh, overall creating the ecosystem. So that's how it started. and evolved to what we have today. Mm -hmm. In 2018, am I right to say that you guys were one of the only VC groups in Armenia that was investing in early stage startups? We were not the only, but back in 2013, 14, uh, High Ventures yeah. and Granatus Ventures started uh, in Armenia. Uh, so uh, maybe I can say that we were the first to be on the ground mm -hmm. and focusing specifically on pre-seed stage with hands-on involvement uh, with the companies and also very, uh, to, to high extent, laser focused on uh, deep tech AI mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. Yeah. How did you guys go about raising your first fund? Uh, was it primarily Armenia-based investors or people abroad as well? I think we don't have uh, pure Armenian-based investors right. in none of our funds. Uh, that, that was a, a funny funny story when you hear back mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that was a pitch of a dream to different people about uh, what these days actually already are mm -hmm. and uh, kind of on the, we are on the way of the realization of this dream but you back the then yeah, dream yeah, yeah yeah but back then it was three guys pitching about this dream about yeah. this future about these opportunities uh, meeting some skepticism uh, in some cases but thanks to those who trusted us uh, and invested and supported uh, back then uh, we could build actually uh, the firm uh, we had uh, among our first investors tim draper yeah uh, who's not Armenian, as you know. Yeah. For those who don't know, Tim Draper is one of the most prominent investors in Silicon Valley. He's invested in Tesla, SpaceX, Twitter. So it's a it's a very big name in the VC community. Yeah, yeah so we started uh, VC with his investment, along with some uh, really close friends yeah. uh, who trusted us back then. And that was the first closing. And then on consequent closings, we had uh, many other mm. uh, entrepreneurs joining us as investors. So how do you go about getting Tim Draper as an investor? You know, it seems like it'd be a hard, in my mind, especially in 2018, it'd be hard to go and pitch this idea to someone someone like Tim Draper to say that we should be investing in early stage startups in Armenia. What yeah, was so, his reaction? Sure. So uh, th there are two parts of this. Uh, first, uh, uh, my uh, co-founder and partner, Han Bartsum, mm -hmm. was working uh, with Tim Draper in Silicon Valley before that. So uh, 
as everything in the VC world, relationship right. matters, most of all. That was uh, number one uh, yeah. thing. So I believe he was supporting his student. Mm -hmm. And then uh, on the other side, it was an opportunity of emerging uh, country. Uh, uh, emerging startups so and, and Tim Draper is one of those investors who really looks into very different opportunities yeah. throughout the world so he back then investing outside Silicon Valley was very rare yeah. for mm, Silicon Valley investors like uh, keep in mind that was pre-COVID times right. yeah. now, <laughs> after COVID things changed a lot but back then it was very rare and Tim Draper was among those who was experimenting investments outside Silicon Valley back then yeah. but in generally if we look at the Armenian ecosystem there were two things first this diaspora that we had uh, in the US and we could link uh, and bridge mm -hmm. uh, easily to the diaspora. But then the other important thing, and sometimes it's not really recognized and appreciated that much, but I have to mention it, it's uh, involvement of European Union. So probably Hero House and SmartGate wouldn't be there if we didn't have that er early days support from uh, European Union for the operations. And it's no, it was not just only SmartGate or Hero House. So it was uh, th there. Uh, they provided a lot of uh, early stage grants back then mm -hmm. that enabled a lot of uh, startups to operate. And Were they directly giving grants to startups or the startup ecosystem organizations like Hero House, Startup no. Academy? Or? It was directly to startups. Mm -hmm. There were competitions uh, and ah, okay. uh, like startups pitch competitions. Were going, yeah, pitch competitions. Startups were pitching uh, at that competitions and uh, getting these uh, grants and precede investment. Is still we invest only when at the moment when we see already a commercial opportunity. Mm -hmm. It can be very vague. It can right. be uh, yeah. a lot of shaping needed, but we already see the commercial opportunity. Right. Uh, yeah. But you still need this friends, family, and fools, let's say, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. segment right. uh, right. that uh, that invest uh, even before the commercial opportunity. Yeah. And in some countries, you can do a lot of savings. Uh, in, so, in some cases, you can have this uh, rich uh, family members. Yeah. But the reality back then in Armenia was you don't have these people. Uh, so, and instead of this family, let's say, uh, you had these grants coming. Yeah. Uh, and in, from that perspective, I believe uh, European Union played a very important Thank role you. Yeah. Uh, in, this, uh, in this early days. It still plays uh, a major role, but I mean, in, in catalyzing these things and yeah. the taking off, it had a very important role back then. Mm -hmm. And are they still continuing their support of the ecosystem? Yeah. 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 For instance, you, you asked if uh, they were providing grants directly yeah. to ecosystem or uh, through organizations. Now, for instance, uh, part of the grants are funneled through Armenia Startup Academy. Mm. That is part of Hero House. Right. So companies that get to Armenia Startup Academy are also, not all of them, but uh, some part of them, uh, get also uh, grants uh, from uh, European Union. Right. Yeah. So it's basically making the academy kind of similar, close to an acceleration program right. with investment, yeah. Yeah. which is very important step uh, at this stage when you can't actually uh, secure, like source a whole cohort of companies uh, right. that are commercially uh, ready for uh, investment. Right. How has the startup landscape in Armenia evolved and matured since that time? But the change is really very dramatic yeah. uh, mainly it's about uh, a lot of expertise that is currently in Armenia that was not there back then so when we were starting hero house in 2017 late 2017 in fact if you wanted some uh, to access some expertise about silicon valley about doing business etc probably a uh, hero house was the only consistent place where you could visit yeah uh, for advice and for meeting different people for expertise, or you should fly to uh, San Francisco. Today, if we look only on our portfolio companies, which uh, raised Series A, seed rounds, went through a lot of hardships and difficulties and have a lot of learnings. So there are so many places in Armenia today that you can just learn, get this expertise. So. Uh, companies like employees in companies thinking of starting their own yeah. things so there is a wave now yeah. and this is very exciting to mm -hmm. observe when you talk about expertise you're talking about expertise in terms of creating startups like entrepreneurship expertise or like engineering talent engineering expertise I'm talking more about building a company yeah. and the business yeah. back then the 
major trend uh, in uh, Armenian entrepreneurship, let's say, was to uh, hide in a room, uh, work on code for a year, mm -hmm. and then find out that no one needs it. Right. <laughs> With launch of Armenia Startup Academy and a lot of other initiatives, we were trying to bring this other perspective of entrepreneurship. So you, you go, you, you become more exploring, you go to uh, your potential yeah. customers, etc. And along with that, uh, being also next to them with uh, on technology side, mm -hmm. which is probably uh, one of the uh, our uh, key differentiators. Uh, one of uh, our partners, Vazgen, uh, he is influencer in AI. I uh, say so he he's uh, professional himself for many many uh, years, and we we could also bring along with business part of things also this uh, technology expertise, right? And uh, these two together uh, made a lot of difference, I believe, for uh, many companies. So, so that's how it's matured to this point where now we see a new Armenian startup raising a large Series A or a few million dollars in their seed round. That's been the biggest differentiator, you think? That was uh, an important contributor. So you say that the startups that are, that you're looking to invest in are at the pre-seed or seed round, right? Um, how do you source those deals in Armenia? Where do you look for those deals? First of all, our, our primary focus is pre-seed, so okay. not even seed. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. We do sometimes for loans in seed, but uh, that's very rare. So our ideal uh, investment is pre-seed stage. And just for our listeners who might not know, pre-seed is the very first round of investment that a startup gets when they're at the idea phase or they've just started implementing uh, their solution. Yeah, so uh, that's our uh, primary focus, uh, and uh, f we look uh, mainly in companies that have some differentiator also in, in technology. Yeah. So this should be uh, ideally some very technical, very science-driven uh, yeah. companies, then build a business, a company that is based on that IP. Uh, where where you guys source those deals? Yeah, in, so uh, in sourcing. So uh, there are a few uh, sources for this. So first of all, it's uh, network, mm -hmm. and we are now uh, span across Armenia and California with our Hero House uh, right. network, and uh, we have a lot of people, founders, advisors, mentors who are in this network, and uh, we can hear about uh, interesting ideas and solid entrepreneurs or yeah. Uh, engineers or others who start something very early and uh, in Armenia these are uh, mainly spin-offs from existing companies or employees of these companies with some experience uh, we also have uh, a lot of cases uh, that diaspora entrepreneurs uh, start something and we help to base part of uh, their operations in Armenia. Yeah. Uh, so overall, I would say uh, right now it's mainly the Armenian world, mm -hmm. uh, widely defined. It's not Armenia, where Armenia is, of course, an important part of it, but it's a wider Armenian world and our networks mm -hmm. across Armenia and the U.S. Do you guys invest outside of the quote-unquote Armenian world as well? I I think I heard you once speak about investments in Eastern Europe, Eastern European startups. And is it the general region or do you guys stick to Armenian founders? We ha are not limited right. to Armenian founders ourselves. We are now actively uh, exploring uh, Eastern European landscape. And we believe that what we learned in this pre seed to seed transformation on one side and then bridging this continent to the US. Yeah. So this, uh, let's call it know-how, is very well applicable also to non-Armenians. Right. Yeah. Uh, and apparently, so we are uh, exploring also that on the Eastern European mm -hmm. landscape. And it seems that there are interesting uh, opportunities there, and over time uh, we expect uh, some pipeline there and leverage the Armenian pipeline, let's mm -hmm. say, into uh, a wider uh, world. Regional. Yeah. How would you say the Armenian startup landscape and ecosystem compares to some of those other countries in our region, Eastern Europe? And oh, we can compare ourselves probably with smaller countries uh, and with, with very small market. And this is our main advantage mm -hmm. because what we see in uh, countries with larger markets, uh, entrepreneurs see some opportunities locally. Mm -hmm. They dive into these opportunities and then it's very difficult to become global after that. It's almost impossible. It's You can uh, claim, okay, we'll test this locally yeah. and then we'll go global, global et cetera. Yeah. But uh, to be honest, it's it's not realistic. Once you dive into uh, your local market, you just stay there. Stay there. <laughs> yeah. 
That's because it's 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 very difficult. You need a mindset shift. Uh, you need you, you are obsessed with uh, these local problems, and it's very difficult to become creative about yeah. uh, global uh, market or U.S. market. So, what happens? You you just stay there, mm -hmm. and uh, but in Armenia you can't do that. So right. from day zero you have to think. Okay, so how I sell this to a large enterprise in the U.S. Right? right. How yeah. are I selling this to consumers in uh, U.S. If it's B2C, so whatever it is from day zero you think about market market there you think about raising your next rounds there right. so everything is laser focused uh, towards global market when i say global in this case i mean initially us and then you can expand to anywhere else from there right and we have very good network there very good preconditions mm -hmm. uh, diaspora in the us is very tech and tech friendly mm -hmm. Uh, so this gives a, a lot of opportunities for the founders. And by the way, this is something that we have pretty good advantage even over other pretty advanced uh, ecosystems uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. So this link that we have with the US and the diaspora, it's a uh, very huge advantage yeah. that we really should appreciate a lot. I want to go back for a second to um, when you were talking about sourcing startups, you were saying that a lot of them spin off from an existing startup, for example, a team at you know one of your portfolio companies might decide to uh, start a company. I'm curious about how that evolved over the years in Armenia. So uh, maybe 10 years ago, based on my understanding, I wasn't here then, my understanding is most tech companies in Armenia were service companies in the sense that they provided their service to the global market through outsourcing and things like that. And eventually that matured into product companies. So in the early days, you had Teamable. Today, you have Crisp and Super Annotate and all these companies. Did those early startups, those product companies, did those spin off from those servicing companies? How is that engineering talent based? So I don't think they uh, were spinning out of service companies. Mm. So some service companies were spinning out of product companies. So well, okay, again, so we have, uh, let's say, Synopsis in Armenia. Right. In a way, it's a service company because it's the R&D uh, center arm mm. uh, for Synopsis. Uh, but it's not it's not an outsourcing company, right? right? So yeah. it's it's they are working on their product. So we had uh, Lycus mm -hmm. in Armenia that gave birth to a lot of a uh, huge number of almost all major outsourcing companies right now. Where like uh, our product of, of Lycus. So in a way, product companies uh, maybe gave birth to service companies, I then see. vice versa. So Armenia in a way started as product companies, but not as entrepreneurs. Right. So Those foreign companies yeah. that had offices. Yeah. Here. So it was diaspora and entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, uh, with some exceptions, so, but like these major companies, these, these were diaspora entrepreneurs that mm -hmm. were bringing this uh, business to Armenia. Or uh, even even Synopsis, they acquired companies in Armenia when they came, and uh, some of them were Armenia-driven uh, right. uh, companies. Right. So, so I think uh, even even in this case, it's more of product companies mm. that gave birth to startups. Of course, existence of servicing industry helped a lot that you eventually have engineers, yeah. trained people yeah. in the ecosystem. So their role is very important. And also, we know cases that over time also service companies uh, converted into product companies. So for instance, one of our portfolio companies, uh, Pingsight, used to be a uh, machine learning uh, outsourcing company. Hmm. And it converted itself into product uh, right. company over time and now it's a very different mindset very right. different approach yeah. so okay that's interesting I, actually i didn't know that so it was these foreign companies that had arms in armenia that really baked that early talent and uh, early engineering talent in armenia that led to the further expansion of the industry here i think uh i think yes that when someone is working on product mm -hmm. uh usually you have more probability of uh, startup spin-off yeah. than someone who is working just on uh, in, in service business. But I wouldn't s be very categorical. So, I mean, maybe if we look at statistics, right. yeah. maybe we figure out that it's 50-50. Right. I don't know. It's like... Uh, they all just have their first impression. Play. Yeah, uh, no, you're right. I, I didn't yeah. make any analysis or right, homework right. On, on this to answer <laughs> no, this question. Yeah. Over the last 18 months, it depends on how you define an Armenian startup, but I, I got that there's about... $200 million in investments in startups in Armenia. And then if you take the wider scope of startups that have a presence in Armenia but are based maybe in L.A. by Armenian founders, it was closer to more than $1.4 in total investments. There was a few very large investments in there that created that number. To be honest, I was surprised by this initially because I thought that given the situation after the war, 
investors might be a little more risk averse in investing in this part of the world. Why the last 18 months were so successful for Armenian startups in terms of capital raised? So first of all, it's not something uh, specific for exclusively Armenian right. startups. Right? World, so it's a global yeah. uh, trend, post-COVID world. Uh, a lot of uh, money was saved right. uh, and not deployed during uh, COVID. Then there was a lot of money just printed right. in There's the high economy, so uh, people didn't have much to do except for buying some uh, cryptocurrencies, right. real estate, <laughs> and stocks. Right. So uh, there, there was some uh, bubble uh, globally, and of course that bubble uh, should reach also Armenian startups that are not Armenian startups, actually. So right. it depends how you look at it. Uh, their heart is Armenian, but their business is U.S., right? right? So uh, their customers the US. are U.S. Yeah. I, I even doesn't matter where they are registered, but where their main capital is coming from, where their customers come from. So this is, this is in its majority, U.S. So uh, apparently this should uh, be reflected mm -hmm. uh, in Armenian companies that are very competitive and brilliant. Like if, if you look uh, the level of entrepreneurs and... Uh, the products they have, uh, so it's very uh, highly competitive. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's apparent that it should be reflected, and right. that's what happened. That's what happened. Yeah. Just look in Armenian startup landscape. Mm -hmm. We have technology leaders globally, not yet business leaders, but yeah. we have technology leaders globally. For instance, uh, Chris being uh, audio and voice, like it beats Google and everyone else yeah. in this domain. So it's not as big as Google yet, but yeah. it's uh, it's uh, on its way. <laughs> on on its on in its niche, right. uh, yeah. in its technology domain, it's uh, better uh, than uh, these leaders for the solution. Yeah, the take uh, take computer vision. So super annotate yeah. with this solution is uh, state of the art globally. Yeah, take machine translation. So model front is mm -hmm. a global leader so it, it is even beyond competition right so uh soon we'll have some other companies in uh, bio and other spaces that are going to be leaders so we have really very uh sophisticated very solid companies mm -hmm. And uh, they deserve this last 18 months' right. uh, success, uh, their pie, let's say, yeah. of, of this bubble. And I believe part of it is very solid and uh, like hardcore that, that is going to remain right. even after the uh, bubble. bubble. Yeah, we shouldn't take anything away from them. Um, I think uh, even a lot of these companies were started before COVID and it aligned with the time where they had a product to show investors, right? And, and they went ahead and they got their piece of that uh, the piece of that bubble, I guess. <laughs> One thing that I think is really interesting about about these startups raising this capital and um, and really growing as startups is that um, employees at startups uh, have stock options. They're compensated in part with equity. Um, and when these startups exit, we're going to see a growing group of both entrepreneurs and probably angel investors. How do you see the next you know few years as these startups mature and exit? What type of what type of catalyst will that be for the startup ecosystem in Armenia? These people are going to be uh, those who ha who saw actual, in some cases, from birth to, uh, I don't know, IPO to yeah. acquisitions to whatever. So what depends which company we look at. Right. So this will be people who or could observe this everything and be part of it. So apparently, we'll have a lot of companies being started uh, yeah. from this wave. And of course, this, uh, these are going to be people who will have like, millions of dollars of right. cash in their pockets right. and uh, they will know how this cash was generated right it's because they are they were part of its generation so they will be much more looking into angel investing yeah and so we'll have a new uh, new generation yeah. and new type of angel investors in armenia mm -hmm. so right now when you look majority of angel investors in armenia are from other industries or, or not really like this. These employees of the companies. Yeah. We didn't have these exits. Right. Or they were very rare uh, before this. But this is going to come. This is going to uh, be a new wave, new generation. And as opposed to the previous generation of angel investors, these people will actually be people from tech that understand the landscape better. Yeah. You're saying. Yeah. yeah. This this will be very different. And this is really how startup ecosystems grow exponentially, right? Like every time in Silicon Valley, a startup goes public or gets acquired, they say, you know, I don't know, 100 angels get their wings um, and they go ahead and they put this capital towards new startups or their own startups. So 
that's I think one one piece of the story that is really exciting to observe over the next uh, five to ten years. I guess you look at other ecosystems, yeah. uh, Estonia, yeah. uh, Sweden, others, Israel. Uh, things start from first unicorn. Right. Yeah. Uh, we can say uh, we already have the first unicorn, Pixar. That right. was uh, last year. They generated mm-hmm. in Armenia was this genesis is uh, in Armenia. So service Titan, uh, yes, but like it, it started, started in, in California, California and yeah. later expanded to Armenia. Uh, but it, it all takes one unicorn yeah. for an ecosystem to uh, take off. And if you look at former Soviet uh, Union and like Eastern Europe, uh, how, how things evolved after the unicorn, you will see like it really in the takeoff and exponential, exponential growth. Yeah. yeah. So if, what's a country in Eastern Europe or the former Soviet Union that has had that exponential growth? Belarus yeah. is uh, Ukraine, although in these days it's... Hard to say. Uh, yeah, yeah, but like uh, with their unicorn companies like Grammarly, Grammarly yeah. they and uh, Amazon Ring. Uh, yeah. I don't, don't remember for sure if it was unicorn when it was acquired, but these kind of cases uh, were very important in kicking off for this ecosystem. Right. Yeah. What about um, the impact of, you spoke about this a little bit earlier, but what about the impact of COVID and the cultural changes that have taken place because of the pandemic. How has the global access to talent and capital changed? There are two major things here. So access to capital, uh, advice, mentorship, yeah. that kind of went away from Silicon Valley as an exclusive place. Now uh, online and Zoom is is the place right. say, for many cases. Uh, I believe over time, it will be uh, it will become again like go back and converge back to more proximity based. So people will still want to invest in uh, companies and founders that are close to them, whom they can uh, grab a coffee with. Mm. But generally, it's not so wild anymore to invest uh, in a founder that is not, let's say, you know, sitting next to in the Bay Area. Right. Like back then, even if you were in t- from Texas. That was so far away yeah. <laughs> uh, for a Silicon Valley investor, yeah. or, or even if if you were like uh, from Glendale, you can you can recall <laughs> stories of Service Titan yeah. that was raising from Silicon Valley from Glendale and sometimes receiving very funny uh, yeah. feedback just for their zip code. Yeah, so uh, it's like a hour and a half flight, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, Forty minutes. Forty minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, yeah, uh, this changed a lot, uh, and the world is not going to be the same again, uh, for sure. So, But you think uh, it'll have some retractive Some, measure. Some, uh, for sure, mm. uh, because human nature yeah. uh, is didn't change, but, That's but right, yeah. habits changed and perception is better right now. Uh, then, uh, for talent, this also made a lot of changes so now freelancing and hiring remote uh, for remote work uh, is more and more frequent Mm -hmm. and what happens is this geographic arbitrage of uh, using other uh, locations uh, for uh, cheaper uh, labor I, I don't want to say like cheap labor. You, for instance, you can, uh, if, if you earn, let's say, five times more in US, it doesn't mean that you live even That's like right, yeah. uh, 10% better. Right. So this, this difference in salaries uh, is uh, kind of justified by uh, the difference in uh, cost base. Cost of living. Yeah, yeah cost of living. So, uh, and now we see kind of equalization throughout everywhere and uh, rising costs. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it's very good, but uh, this is the reality. So, yeah. um, Let's talk a little bit about Hero House in LA, in Glendale. You spoke a little bit of earlier about this being a uh, an operation for with which you guys can source startups f- from the diaspora. When you guys are looking to invest in the, the larger Armenian landscape, um, is it important for you guys for those startups to have a presence in Armenia or have a plan to have a presence in Armenia? There is nothing formal right. in this and uh, there is nothing that we put as a re- requisite or right. requirement. But this is something that uh, eventually happens. Right. <laughs> so I think that's that's the most important part okay. uh, in this story. Yeah. So uh, generally, our style is not uh, making any legal requirements right. or yeah. like uh, imposing something. Uh, we just make it happen through value that can actually be generated and created yeah. through that. So through, right. through being present mm-hmm. in Armenia. So that's that's uh, how we uh, make it happen. What's the startup activity like in Glendale or just in 
the diaspora in in general? Do you see a lot of activity? I wouldn't uh, focus now on Glendale alone. Right. So yeah. let's let's say Southern California. Okay. And in Southern California, you don't have any leaders in pre-seed uh, landscape. So it's is that because it's just too close to San Francisco? I guess so. That's one of the reasons. Uh, because it's so close, it it doesn't have an ecosystem of its own. Right. Although it has all the building blocks, so it has. Uh, Great universities yeah. uh, like Caltech, USC, and others. It has uh, talent. It has people. But the weather is good. <laughs> <laughs> weather is also yeah good. It has uh, some industries yeah. uh, which are leading mm -hmm. globally. But then uh, when you look at pre-seed uh, landscape, there are no distinguished leaders uh, like we could see in uh, Silicon Valley. So there are a lot of opportunities yeah. there uh, that we see uh, for Hero House. And uh, we believe over time there can be uh, uh, built this leadership mm -hmm. uh, in some niches, and uh, that's what we are niches doing. Niches like what? In, in some niche areas, uh, like maybe gaming hmm. uh, or uh, some specific uh, software as a service solutions mm -hmm. uh, with uh, with intersection of AI. Yeah. So these these are things that we are exploring ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we don't have this final say tactics and right. uh, picture for us but generally we see a lot of opportunities there when did you guys open the hero house in glendale how long has it been well it was uh, last year july that we launched it okay so like yeah. six, seven it, 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 it was supposed to be earlier but covid, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> was uh, was a problem yeah what are some of the programs you guys run there the major program we have there is a gateway accelerator and it is uh, focused on local community uh, in, in Southern California, uh, as well as uh, wider Eastern Europe, which right. includes Armenia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have companies from uh, Poland, Ukraine over time uh, mm -hmm. uh, being there, as well as Armenians and both from here and uh, from uh, California. That's the major uh, program. We also have Angel Network there, so Hero House Angels, uh, which primarily California-based angels, uh, where we send their way uh, co-investment opportunities with our fund. Actually, before we move on, uh, this is a, a theme that I think is really interesting. When you look at diasporan uh, Armenia relations, I think one of the most successful projects has been some of these startups that started in California or in other parts of the world, and then they opened up large offices in Armenia. Uh, I think it's one of the most tangible, how would you say it, uh, like positive impacts that uh, the diaspora has had uh, in Armenia. So Service Titan's office here is quite big now. They employ a lot of people. Disco has a presence here. Do you see that trend growing? By the way, uh, it's controversial. Okay. So if, if, if we look from the perspective of the world ecosystem, it's controversial. Some some may complain uh, about new companies coming to Armenia. Why is Bec that? Uh, because it's a competition for talent. Right. right? And we have a huge shortage of talent now as as well as uh, any other country now so it's not specific mm -hmm. for armenia only but because industry is growing no education can catch up after right. that growth and we don't need juniors per se so yeah. first of all we need senior uh, people so when when some company comes to armenia they are going after the same seniors that mm -hmm. are existing right but for instance what is very important now and which is very valuable for ecosystem in armenia for instance we'll take same uh, case of uh, service titan is uh, these companies have the ability to relocate repatriate people to Armenia, hmm. as well as non-Armenians, right. so uh, bring them to Armenia, because they are very attractive as companies, uh, well-funded, US-based, yeah. um, with all the structures and culture and capital available for this, so they can relocate people from other countries to Armenia and uh, basically expand the talent pool. Right. So that's where uh, their uh, impact. value add mm. and impact comes to our Armenia, along with, of course, a lot of uh, knowledge and practices, right. uh, just management practices uh, that a big company brings uh, on the table for the ecosystem. Do we see that repatriation happening now? We do see. Uh, it's, uh, it's a bit controversial, I hear, uh, that people leave Armenia, but I don't know anyone who left. Right. So I hear a lot about <laughs> people leaving, but I, I know people who <laughs> repatriate it. <Yeah>. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's but it's maybe uh, because of my network, maybe right. like uh, still there are people who are leaving the country. Right. But I believe uh, overall, Armenia is much better place 
than any other uh, spot uh, in the U.S. I can that's that one I can compare. Right, like, uh, can say for sure for Europe. But for US, uh, definitely, it's much better place to stay, and I think you can. <laughs> <laughs> I can attest. <laughs> <that. laughs> well, especially, I mean, now in our industry, in the tech industry, when you have these startups that are paying very competitive salaries, you know, your your lifestyle in Armenia could be much higher than in the US. Even if in the US they pay you a little bit more, but comparatively to, as you were saying, the cost of living. You know, if you if you can get into one of these companies, your li- your lifestyle will be fantastic. So if you yeah. live in Armenia and yeah. you travel enough, like so, uh, to be uh, still be part of the global right. world and yeah. not not to sheltered, uh, not here. to become a too much uh, local, then uh, this is just a perfect world. Yeah, <laughs> I can I can agree to that to some extent. Let's talk about challenges. Um, so. What what would you say the biggest challenge to Armenian startups right now is? And specifically, what are the challenges related to access to talent here? But by the way, when I say talent, not just engineering talent, but you know, these startups look for biz dev people, for marketing specialists, managers. How's the landscape for that today? And what are the solutions to fill those gaps? So uh, in this case, probably when we say Armenian, we mean Armenia based. Yes, right? yeah, so yeah. Armenia started. Uh, so indeed, uh, it's uh, talent, uh, especially in biz dev, etc., is a problem and as well as engineering. So sometimes people tell me uh, we want to send some jobs to Armenia. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I like what kind I don't of know. People <laughs> like, I don't know, some some outsourcing jobs, right. etc. Yeah. So or, or set up some uh, small shop, dev yeah. shop in Armenia. Yeah. I say good luck. Like, <laughs> this is hard it, to find. It, yeah, it's, it's yeah. not it's not that easy yeah. uh, thing. So it's not that people are sitting at home and right. waiting <laughs> for a job. So it's it's, right. it's different. Right. What is uh, lacking is expertise, senior expertise on the ground. Mm-hmm. And in some cases, especially when it comes to sales marketing, where you have to be part of the industry, you need to know to have domain specific knowledge. Yeah. So this is uh, almost impossible to gain just being in Armenia. Right. It's, yeah. You have to be part of that industry. You have to work there, yeah. uh, some experience, uh, etc. Before you can do that. So here again, link to diaspora is very important uh, mentorship advising that uh, area is very crucial and uh, maybe in some cases there can be uh, co-founder matches so some business people uh, joining tech people mm-hmm. here in Armenia so these are these are the cases uh, and this this is this is a challenge yeah this is a challenge in the non-engineering side so biz dev marketing sales a lot of these initiatives in the tech community are looking to train people in those professions. For example, I know Digitain has an entire program where they uh, train people to become project managers or product managers. Do you think these initiatives are enough or does something need to happen at the university or business school level in order to fill this talent gap? It's never enough. Yeah, The gap is big first. Second, yeah. uh, you always need more and more uh, professional approach to this, more and more better results. So there is a lot of work to do there. Yeah. Uh, it's very important and good that some of the companies do this, uh, but also on university level, this is very important. Like people need to be more prepared yeah, to for those roles, uh, to careers, uh, and uh, with more hands-on uh, experience. Yeah, absolutely. Ashut, uh, my last question is: uh, I am going to ask this question to every guest for SmartGate and for the wider Armenian startup ecosystem. How do you see the coming five to ten years? What would be a successful outcome for you? When we look at this uh, five ten year perspective, mm-hmm. uh, we can take it from two points of view. So, what what's going on with Armenia and what will change in Armenia? So, I believe tech is a shortcut to prosperity mm-hmm. for the country, and what will change actually uh, is we'll have kind of deep state. Mm-hmm. And what I mean here uh, when I say deep state is people with capital and sense of ownership for the country. Right. So. People who care and have power. Right. It's, it won't be dependent on, on governments anymore. It won't be dependent on some speculations that are short term. But there will be a long term vision, long term understanding, uh, and long term backbone for mm-hmm. the country. So this is this is what is going to happen when these uh, tech people grow their businesses and right. become become influential and powerful. And for from SmartGate perspective, uh, so SmartGate is an investor in so-called moonshots. These are companies that initially don't seem to be very attractive. Hmm. So you know they are attra- they are attractive because you are part of their journey, because you you are part of them and. Uh, 
you know it from inside. But then they grow, uh, and so no one notices them until everyone notices them. Right. Uh, so they grow uh, and change the way we live, uh, the change uh, industries work. So I believe uh, that in this 10-year perspective, we'll have some companies in our portfolio that will change not only a lot, change a lot not only for Armenia, right. because they are, are they are partly Armenian, but also uh, how people in the world uh, live, and they will make the world a better place. Mm-hmm. I said that was my last question, but you opened a new topic that is really interesting I want to touch on for a second. So this wealth that is being generated in Armenia in the, for these startups, um, these these founders who are accumulating this wealth, you're right, when they speak about their involvement in Armenia, why they're doing what they're doing, they talk in a sense that they want to take ownership of problems in the country. And it's very different, I think, from the former... Um, you know, in Armenia, we say elita, like the former elites. How do you think um, the values of this new group of people who will start to have large amounts of capital and want to use that capital for the development of the country will differ from the former ones? Yeah, well, uh, the former ones were based on stealing. Right. They were based on corruption and monopoly, right. and monopoly in a very bad sense. Right. Because startups are monopolies, right? But in a very good sense, like by Peter, merit, like by <laughs> definition of Peter Thiel, right? So uh, I even don't know how this happened because probably you could steal money, but I- you could have some kind of approach that uh, uh, some kind of level, uh, your internal level, when you compete not for the brightness or right. uh, size of your villa, but for instance, uh, for how how fast and good is your drone right. that you yeah. developed. Uh, yeah. like, if you, even if you are stealing, uh, but you have some different level of mindset, probably we would end up in a different uh, condition now. Than we are today. Yeah. So uh, I, I, it's, it's even cultural problem, I think, uh, that we had uh, this last, uh, I don't know how many years. Yeah. So I, I believe this new elite that is going to come, it will, the most important difference here is going to be this cultural difference, hmm. the difference in approach and... Uh, understanding the priorities, uh, yeah. etc. I think especially post-war, there was a renewed sense of conversations in the tech community about what we do is we, we are doing in service of um, playing our role in the, in the development of the country. So I think what that will bring is to be seen, um, but it's an extremely interesting space to watch. And then very last question. As your startups are maturing, are you? Do you guys plan to participate in their Series A, Series Bs, or are you guys going to stay focused on the pre-seed round? Our uh, expertise and power is in pre-seed, right? So we are going to be there uh, with our second fund. Uh, we can also follow on uh, in uh, later rounds. Yeah. So we'll do up to seed rounds uh, in investment, but not later. Okay. So, because you know, when you advance as a company, it's not so difficult for you anymore to raise uh, from the best U.S. VCs, right? So, uh, the the key here is the key to success is uh, making this happen and working on the very early days. Yeah. Uh, and this is where our expertise is, and uh, this is where we are going to be. Keep focused. your focus. Yeah. Okay, Ashut, thank you so much for uh, coming on and giving us the overall perspective on where the Armenian startup ecosystem is and where it's going. And in the future, I hope you'll join us again to talk about uh, the further uh, development of the system. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. Thank you for listening to this segment of the EVN Disrupt podcast. You can follow us on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you consume podcasts. Also, make sure to follow EVN Report on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date for more engaging content from Armenia. Thank you.